Join me in the New Testament in John chapter 14. That's where we're going to be this morning. John chapter 14, verse 6. I think God is in our presence today. I know it. Um, I uh, have been gone for the last 10 days uh, serving on an awesome team uh, in Peru. And I'll talk a little bit about that this morning because this sermon was... uh, the sermon was produced while I was gone. Um, I sat down last night to look over my notes and realized that I had written all my notes in a, in a notebook this week while I was on an airplane and in uh, driving down the Pan American Highway and in the Bumpy Mountains, and I realized I couldn't read the notes, so I had to retype them, so you guys nearly got off the hook. But in uh, John chapter 14, verse 6, is where God led me this morning. And if you would, uh, would y'all stand with me? Let's stand together and read uh, God's Word together, this, this one verse. Let's, let's do it together. It says, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Father, we come before you this morning, Lord, and this is your Word. Your Word says that there is no other way but Christ. Um, Lord, we live in a culture where that is a very countercultural, exclusive statement. A lot of people don't believe that. But Lord, find us this morning believing our Creator. Lord, you said this. You said that no man comes unto the Father unless he comes through Jesus Christ. You say that you are the way and you are the truth and you are the life, that there's no other way for man to spend eternity in heaven with you unless they come through Jesus. And Lord, we know that our culture teaches that we can do it on our own. We know that other religions claim other ways. But Lord, you are the author of life. And Lord, you said this. So find us believing this morning. Lord, let your word not go out void. Lord, I pray all this in Christ's name and God's people say together. Amen. You guys can can have a have a seat. This, uh, for those of you that might not have been here, we're kind of in the middle of a, of a sermon series called The Radical Sayings of Jesus, The Rattle, rat, Radical Statements of Jesus Christ. And we, uh, over the last several weeks, we've talked about some things that Jesus said that, were, that are true uh, because it's his word and he's God and he has the authority to say the things that he says. Amen? But our culture uh, might say something totally different. And so what, what really shouldn't be radical often seems radical because of our sin and because of where we have taken things. And we've said, uh, we said one week that one of those statements was that Jesus said to love your enemies. And uh, you guys will remember that week where that's very countercultural. Uh, it's hard to, you remember I said it's hard to love people who don't reciprocate love, uh, who don't love you back. It's hard to love your enemies, but that's what Jesus said to do. Uh, we, one week we talked about being a servant. Uh, our world teaches us something totally opposite. Our ter- world teaches us, to, especially our culture in America, teaches us to be served, to climb to the top of the ladder, step on whoever we can step on to get there, and have people serve us in life. But Jesus said, be a servant, and he exemplified that. Um, I, and and uh, this morning we see another verse uh, this morning where really we find life's meaning in this where Jesus said I'm the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to me no one comes to the Father unless they come through me it, there's an exclusive statement here that says that there is one way for all people and that's exclusivity and we'll get there in just a little while there, there's an exclusive way for salvation um, and, and that's kind of where we're going this morning. I wanted to say thank you to Josh Swindle uh, for preaching for me last week while I was gone. Uh, our youth group got to share a little bit about their mission trip this summer to Panama City. And Josh uh, shared with you last week about abandoning for the sake of the gospel and about sacrifice. And, uh, and so, Josh, I appreciate you uh, doing that. I, I've told you before as a pastor, we got some awesome, awesome guys here that, that can preach, and, and the, you know, I don't even have to worry about it. I went to Peru and went and served, and, and, uh, and it just, it's just awesome to be able to go and do that and know that God's Word is being, uh, being shared. I want to take just a second before we get into this also just to tell you a little bit um, about this trip to Peru. Um, we, our team had an opportunity to go and do, uh, to do a basketball camp in San Luis. Uh, they wanted some pros to come down there, and so we, uh, we, uh, we packed up, and, and we volunteered, and we headed down. I'm just kidding. We were, uh, we were pros on the eight-foot goals, and, um, and so we went down there, and we were able to, uh, throughout the week, to minister to about 20 to 25 kids that came to our camp, and uh, we used our breaks in between doing basketball skills 
Uh, the camp is where we built relationships with the kids, but we used our break in between to orally tell Bible stories uh, from all the way from creation to the resurrection of Christ. And, uh, and then we were able on the last day to invite all the kids to a pizza party. They'd never had American pizza. Uh, I guess pizza is really Italian, but they never had pizza, and so we had a pizza party. And, uh, and we were able to share the gospel with them and give them an opportunity uh, to respond. Uh, another really cool thing that happened on this trip is that uh, in San Luis, Peru, where Josh and Crystal and Isaac and Ella live in the northern Conchucos area, um, you have a lot of Quechuan people. And Quechua is, a, is an oral language, and so the gospel is now being translated orally uh, from Genesis all the way to Revelation, and they're using these stories from the Bible. They're being recorded, and they're trying to get the gospel out uh, to the people. And so um, Jason Price, one of our team members, made copies of, of, of those stories, 21 of those stories from Genesis to Revelation. And we we're able to go and distribute those. This is a really cool thing. This would never happen in America, but we we're able to take those to the bus stations. And some of the, the, the managers of the bus stations are giving them to the bus drivers so they can play them over the public buses as they go and hear the, and hear the gospel. And it's a really cool thing. Um, that, it's just a, yeah, somebody's clapping. That's, I mean, that's an awesome, awesome uh, thing. Um, we, were, we were able uh, with this team to spend time in uh, worship with Josh and Crystal and Isaac and Ella, do a worship service for them in English, which they very rarely get. And so that was a, that was a cool thing. Um, we were able to go to one of the storing project meetings. Uh, I send greetings to you from Frederico and Rosa. They said to tell Crosshaven hi, and they said it in Quechuan, and I can't even, I don't even remember how to say it. Um, but they wanted to tell you hi, and, and um, they, they said, tell, tell hello, Crosshaven Church. And, uh, and so uh, they were excited that folks from, um, from Estados Unidos, from the United States, came. Um, he said, you are very educated, and you understand the Bible, and people here not so much. The, the, the culture is so blended, and we've been taught so many things that aren't real and, and, and are not of God. And, and, and they just wanted us to know that they were very thankful for coming, and so we, we got to go every Monday night. Uh, Josh and Crystal have a storing project meeting in their home where they come in and they record the Bible stories in Quechuan. And, uh, and uh, so we got to, to be a part of that. Um, and then another cool thing was that there was, this is so cool, there was, a, there was a pastor's conference going on in San Luis where we were, and there were 32 pastors uh, who had come. Just uh, Some of them had walked there, some for hours, a, couple, a few of them had walked for a couple of days just to come to this conference uh, to get there and be taught by someone who was teaching biblical hermeneutics so that they could go back and just understand a little bit better about the word they were trying to teach people. And, uh, and, and Jason uh, Price and Josh went back. Um, I feel bad. A couple of us were watching a movie that night, and the rest of them, they were recording more CDs. And to get to these pastors. So we were able to distribute 32 of those CDs to the pastors to take back to their communities in northern Conchucos and southern Conchucos and in the Wireless Valley where they'll go back and be able to share the gospel um, with people in their, um, in, in their areas. And so it was, a, it was an awesome, awesome thing. We nearly missed our plane yesterday, uh, but here we are. And um, it was all to share the message and to help the people there to be able to better we didn't want to go and americanize them they don't need to be americanized they just need to know the one true way and and it was that that there's no other way to the father unless you come through jesus christ to to share that i say all that to say this our need is no different here in coleman alabama our need is no different no matter who you are if you don't get this verse then you don't get life if you don't get this verse, then, then, then you don't get life. This, this thing's a deal breaker. I mean, life hinges on John chapter 14, verse 6. I'm the way, and I'm the truth, and I'm the life. This was Jesus speaking. It's, it's in red in the Bible. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's nothing, there's nothing more important than that, is there? No other way but Christ. No other way. Now, let's kind of go back a little bit and work our way toward this verse this morning. Look in John chapter 13 with me. John chapter 13, because we, we need to get the context of where Jesus came from when he, when he said this. Jesus is, like I said, Jesus is making this radical, exclusive claim that he is the only way. 
And, and in chapter 13, you're going to find that Jesus was with his disciples. He was with his closest followers. Verse 1 of chapter 13 shows us the intensity of the moment. It says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So it, it was not, if you read that, you understand in this setting that it would not be long until Jesus would die a martyr's death on a cross and he would do it for our sin. And we're getting to this place, honestly, in Scripture where the rubber meets the road. I mean, all of Scripture is God-breathed. It's all important. But you get right here, and this is where the rubber meets the road. This is life or death. And, and so in this context, in chapter 13, Jesus is talking about some big things here that, that he, he wanted to make sure that his disciples understood. He, he talks like in, in uh, some deep things, like in verses 5 through 9, Jesus is talking about servanthood. We, we spent one week on that in this in this message series, but in, in verse 5, he says that they're, they're, they're at the Passover, and it says he poured water into a basin, and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, and Simon Peter, Peter is, uh, was a bedrock of the New Testament church, but Peter was the outspoken guy in the group. Peter was the knucklehead in the group. I mean, Peter, Peter, uh, I mean, so Peter speaks up. He came to Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered him, he said, what, what I'm doing you do not understand now, Peter, but afterward you will understand. And Peter said to him, I mean, Peter's, Peter, Peter looks at him and says, Jesus, you're not going to wash my feet. I mean, you're Jesus. We're supposed to be washing your feet. He said, you, you shall never wash my feet, Jesus answered him. And look at what Jesus said. He said, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Now go back over and read our main verse this morning, John chapter 14, verse 6. I'm the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is prefacing that with this verse. Peter, if I don't wash you, he's not talking about washing feet. He said, Peter, if I don't wash you clean, speaks to everyone in this room, everyone in this world. If, if you're not washed by the blood of Jesus Christ, you have no share with me. And Simon Peter, now this is cool. This is so it's funny to me. Simon Peter said to him, well, Lord, not my feet only, but my hands and my head. I mean, Simon said, oh, okay, I get it now. Yeah. And, and then you move on in the Scripture, and, and, and Jesus is talking about servanthood. You get down to verse 21. I mean, this is some compelling stuff. In verse 21 through 30, Jesus predicts the betrayal of Judas Iscariot. I mean, can you imagine that setting? They're sitting at the Lord's Supper. They're, they're at the Passover meal. And after Jesus is talking to them about servanthood, it says in verse 21, after saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit. And he testified, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Could you imagine being one of the 12 disciples and having followed after Jesus and sitting there and Jesus makes that statement and you're thinking, oh no, I hope it's not me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. Do you imagine them just kind of looking around? It's not me, it's probably you. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. And one of his disciples whom Jesus loved, that's John, it was, it was Jesus' closest companion, Jesus' best friend. John looked after Jesus' mother after Jesus died. He was reclining at the table close to Jesus. And verse 24 says, here's Peter again. So Peter, knowing that John's his best friend, Peter motions over. He'll probably listen to you before he'll listen to me. So Simon Peter motioned to him and asked to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. Hey, John, do you think you might could just... Ask, whisper in Jesus' ear and ask him, you know, just make sure it's not me or you. You know, ask him who it is. So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, it is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So they're all thinking, man, I hope he drops the bread on the floor. Don't dip it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he'd taken the morsel, and, and it wasn't like Jesus randomly picked it. Judas was, Satan was already working in Judas' life. Sa Satan was already there. If you go back to 13 verse 2, it says, During the supper when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, to betray Jesus. So it was Judas. After he'd taken the morsel, Satan entered into him, and Jesus said to him, What are you going to do? Whatever you're going to do, then do it quickly. Now, no one at the table knew why he'd said this to him. Some thought that 
because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him to buy what they need for the feast. I mean, some of them thought he was just telling Judas to run down to the grocery store and get the rest of the stuff. Or to give something to the poor. But verse 30 says, So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. So you see the prediction of Judas's betrayal of Jesus. Now, you get down to verses 34 and 35, down in that area, it says, Jesus begins to talk about loving one another. We had a whole week on this. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I've loved you. You're also to love one another. By this, this is, listen, this is, this is important, church. It says, by this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. This is how people know that the church is the church. This is how people know that we are his disciples when we reciprocate what Jesus Christ has done for us. They're not going to know we're the church by having a building. They're, they're not going to know we're the church by us having great worship services. All those things are important, okay? But people are going to know that we are disciples by the way we love them if we can reciprocate the same love that Jesus Christ has shown us back to other people. And then, here's Peter again. Verses 36 through 38, Jesus foretells Peter's denial. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered him, where, where I'm going, you cannot follow me. Now, Jesus had to be the one to die on the cross. Only Christ can uh, bring propitiation for sin. That's why Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No one comes to me, no one comes to the Father unless they come through me. Only Jesus could have done what Jesus did. If somebody else had died on the cross for us, then we wouldn't be here today where there would be no point. God had to die for sin. And, and so Jesus says, where I'm going right now, Peter, you, you can't follow me now, but you will follow afterward. You may die for the faith, Peter. And, and Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I, I'll lay down my life for you. Boy, haven't we made Jesus' promises before too? And Peter, Peter said, Lord Jesus, I would lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, Peter, I say to you that the rooster, the rooster will not crow until you've denied me three times. I mean, that's what, he, that's what he said. He said, you'll deny me three times, Peter, before the rooster crows. And when we know from reading the scripture that, that that's what happens is that Peter did deny Jesus. When the, when the going got tough, Peter said, I, I don't even know who Jesus, I don't know who you're talking about. I don't know Jesus. I'm not one of his followers. And then we get to chapter 14, verse 1. So Jesus is saying all this stuff to the disciples. Jesus is about to die on the cross. There's a lot of unrest with the disciples. Jesus is telling them what has to happen and, and, and here's the thing, the disciples knew, okay? I mean, they knew what had to happen. They'd been following. I mean, they, they weren't dumb as bricks. I mean, they'd been following Jesus. They knew what had to happen. But, but maybe, maybe kind of get it in your mind's eye. Maybe you're kind of like this. I am sometimes. You, you, when you know that something's about to really happen, it, it's just like that with us. When, it, when it's time for something new or when it's time for something that's important, and even though we know how it's supposed to play out and what's supposed to happen, we begin to get nervous when it's really time for it to happen, don't we? Um, let me give you an example. Like with my wedding, when Sharon and I got married. You know, I was excited. It was the biggest day of my life to that point besides being saved, and I was excited about being married. I didn't... Don't look at me like that. I'm, it's not a bad story. I knew, I knew, you know, I knew that, I just knew in my heart that we were supposed to be together. I knew she wasn't going to walk down the aisle and just say no when she got down there. But even, even, because, even but because it was a big day, I was nervous. And I wanted everything to go perfect. I'm just that kind of person. I, I wanted it all to be the way I planned it. And it's about 30 minutes before the wedding, and my college roommate, my best friend, walks out, and he had a dual role in the wedding. He was one of my, one of my, uh, one of my groomsmen, but he was also uh, one of the guys that was supposed to play pre-wedding music. He was a violinist, and he was supposed to play pre-wedding music, and he walks out in the hallway, and he has on no pants. He's got on his tuxedo jacket and his shirt and his tie, and he, he has on no pants. He's just wearing his boxer shorts, and I said, um, this is not going to work out too great, and he said, well, the pants they sent me are a different color than everybody else's. He says, so what am I supposed to do? And so we had to send him out there in his boxer shorts, and there's a, there was a half wall there hidden. So he's out there playing the violin in his underwear. 
before the meeting. They had to send somebody over and get his pants right quick before the wedding started. Luckily, it was just across the street. And, you know, and, and I'm, so I'm getting nervous. I mean, I know it's supposed to go well, but it's not working out the way I had, had planned it. And so things, uh, uh, even like flying to Peru on our mission trip. I mean, I, I'm believing the plane's going to get us there. I know it's supposed to and all that. But I'm praying the sinner's prayer again before we take off. I'm like, Lord, just in case, if I'm not saved, please save me now, you know, in case we, it, you know, and, and all that. Now, y'all have done that. You've done it before. You've been on a roller coaster and said, Lord, if this happens to be the time this thing falls off the track, just in case, um, do that. So there's, ner- there's nervousness, there's doubting, there's fearing, even though we know what's supposed to happen. And Jesus understood that. That's what the disciples were. These were the, these were the closest followers of Christ. But in John four, chapter 14, verse 1, Jesus had to tell them. He had to tell them straight up, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Why? Because they had a promise as believers, as followers of Christ. And this is our promise too. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, if if He is your Lord, then Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. It's an encouraging word. You should be encouraged by that this morning as a believer. Because you can say that and you can believe it. And then we read verses 2 through 4 and we're working our way back to verse 6. It says, this is awesome. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so... Would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And verse 3 says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That's the Christian faith, isn't it? That's what we bank our lives on. And he says, And you know the way to where I'm going. If you're a believer, you know the way to where I'm going. This is, this is your hope. But don't forget, they knew, but their minds weren't on that. They were losing sight of the end result. And then there's a guy named Thomas. And, and if you know anything about Thomas, the disciple, Thomas was the doubter. Now, now, Thomas is not all bad. I mean, Thomas was a great follower of Christ, but he was the doubter of the group. Every group has a doubter, doesn't it? Every group has a Thomas, a naysayer, the negative guy that's a part of the group that just has to be negative because he's negative. Peter was outspoken, but Thomas was the biggest doubter thomas was the guy that when you ask him hey thomas how was the movie he just says well it was all right every movie he watches it was, it was okay you hey thomas you want to go with us well maybe let me let me think about it hey hey thomas how was dinner last night well it was, it was pretty good i've had better i mean it was okay that that's thomas thomas couldn't see the forest for for the trees thomas had forgotten that jesus had to die And Jesus had to rise again so that there would be salvation for the nations. He he, he just lost sight of it. You know, as as we, when we were on the mission trip, as we were, as we rode along the Pan American Highway and we we were just looking out over the Pacific Ocean, as we rode through the, through the Andes Mountains, and and this is my fifth time to go, and, and maybe you just miss it sometimes when you see what you see every day. But I started to think, you know, here's Thomas. He'd been walking with Jesus, and he was doubting God. And I was just looking at his creation, and I started thinking, and, and, and Lord knows I've gone through periods of time in my life where I've dealt with doubt and fear and all kind of things. But as I went through that, I thought, how can anybody doubt God? How can anybody doubt God? Romans, the book of Romans says even his creation will make him known. Even his creation will make him known. But Thomas, a disciple of Jesus, doubted. And we often do that too. And verse, verse, five, verse 5 shows us Thomas's question of doubt. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? But Thomas knew. But he's, he's unfocused. Lord, how, how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I mean, this radical, countercultural, let me just be real honest, exclusive statement by Jesus is a result of all this and Thomas's doubting question. Verse 6 is that, how do you go to heaven verse? Something that, that they knew, and Jesus had to remind them, I'm the way, believe in me, and me only, and you will go 
to heaven. Now, when Jesus says this totally countercultural type of statement, here's what I mean by that. There's, there's this balance, and go with me here for just a second in our time that we have. There's this balance in our culture, in our society, between exclusiveness and inclusiveness. And, and what Jesus says here is totally exclusive. Christianity, and, it's, and I want you to go here with me because it's not a popular statement. We, we want to say, well, you, you know, uh, all you got to do is just pray this prayer and everybody will be saved. It's not, it's not that. Jesus said, you have to deny yourself and you have to follow me. You, you have to be the real deal. You have to be a believer. And only those who know Jesus Christ in a personal way have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Only those people will be saved. Christianity is an exclusive faith. Now, let me give you some examples of exclusiveness. Because exclusiveness can be good and it can be bad. I mean, you have exclusiveness in things like country clubs or social clubs or ball teams. That, I mean, that can be good or that can be get bad, I guess. I don't know. And sometimes exclusiveness can be really bad. Like when you, when, when you see kids leaving other kids out and you know somebody is hurt by being left out of something. Or when you see adults doing the same thing who haven't grown up and still leave people out because they think they're better than them or they have more than them or whatever. You see, and here's what's even worse, is that you see churches doing it. You see churches saying, well, you're not of our social status or you, you, know, you don't fit in. I'm thankful to be a part of a church that just really could care less about that and we just want to share the gospel with Je of Jesus Christ with people. So it, exclusiveness can be a bad thing. You find exclusiveness in, in, in other religions, and really in every other one, not, not just Christianity. Muslims are exclusive. If you don't pay homage to Allah and follow after the teachings of Muhammad, you know, you're, then, then you are denied and you are, you know, you're outside the faith. And you could, be, you could be killed because of that. It's an exclusive thing. Jehovah's Witness, they, they believe they're the one true church. If you're not part of the 144,000 and, and then the, ever how they do it, and then they change what they believe every couple of months, and, but they say, you got to be a part of this. But what about Christianity? What about our faith? It's, it's exclusive too. It's very exclusive. Scripture tells us that only the elect will inherit the kingdom of God that only the sons and daughters of Christ will be a part of the kingdom, that those who don't know Christ, that many will stand before the Lord, and they'll say, Lord, didn't I do good things in your name? Didn't I do this? And Jesus will say, depart from me, I never knew you. It's an exclusive faith. But here's the difference. This kind of exclusiveness is good. It's, it's different because God says it. It's not something man made up. Now, there's also inclusiveness, and inclusiveness, I guess, can be good, and it can be bad, too. It can be good. We're supposed to love other people. That's inclusiveness. Including other people, reaching out to other people. I, I think about kindergarten games where everybody gets to participate and nobody keeps score. I mean, I guess that that, hey, that can be good. But inclusiveness can be bad. You think about universalism that says, be your own God, and everybody's their own God, and everybody's going to go, you know, to heaven or whatever. Or you think about culturally inclusiveness, the whole issue we've dealt with lately with homosexuality, that everybody's equal and everybody does, you know, just do what you want and God's okay with it. God created us to, just to love. But Jesus' claim right here, this benchmark statement of the Christian faith, is very exclusive. So what makes it different than, say, a Muslim claiming that allegiance to Allah and devotion to the Quran is the only way? The answer is very simple. Because of who makes the claim. I'm not going to bank my life on something that Muhammad said. I'm not going to bank my life on something that I say. I'm going to bank my life on what Jesus Christ says. Muhammad makes the claims of the Muslim faith. Joseph Smith made the claims of the Mormon faith. He said Jesus lived in America and he found some gold tablets out in the woods that told him that. I'm not going to believe that. But God makes the claim of Christianity. You either believe the Bible or you don't. You believe that it's God-breathed and God-ordained and that God said it. And Jesus is God. 
With Christianity, you find the only religion known to man where the one who makes the claim for the way of salvation is God himself. I think we got these verses on the screen. Look at John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Verse 3 says, All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Amen? And then look at verse 14. I think we've got that one there too. Do we have that one, Mitchell? Yep. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and full of truth. With Christ, you take it out of man's hands and you put it in the Creator's hands. Jesus Christ is God. I'm not going to trust a man that's no different than me to save me, and I'm not going to trust me to save me. Because here's what happens when man starts directing his own life. Let me, let me give you an example. Like in Peru, here's what you have. You have a culture that has taught them to believe a certain way. You have animism that's been passed down from tribes, and so they, they worship the sun god, and they worship the fertility god, and they worship all these different idols that they made up and then it's blended with a with a social ca uh, catholicism that's come in and it's they're not teaching christ at all but they've just blended and so you've got the catholic church that's practicing the animism and having all these spirit festivals and parades and all these things and it's just a social thing where they give them money and they don't teach jesus christ uh, as the savior and then here's the thing you can go in and you could very easily, without building relationships with them, you could throw Jesus in on top of that, and they would say, we love Jesus too. And they have no idea what they believe. Because it's been made up for them, and they've bought into it. They've listened to what man has taught them. And we think that's crazy, but it's, it's similar here. People trying to be good, people working hard, people going to church some, people who made a decision when they were a, a kid in church, and I would never discount that. I came to Christ when I was a kid, and most of you did too. But we do live in a culture that says, well, I prayed a prayer when I was seven, but never had a life change. I've never lived for Christ, but boy, I, I bet I'm going to go to heaven. Not real devotion. Not real disciples. We just build our own personal Jesus. That was a song back in the 80s, I think, or early 90s. We make Jesus be what we want him to be. That's what we try to do. But no matter where you live, it all boils down to, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? It all boils down to asking this question, what are you going to bank your life on? Something God says or something man comes up with? And why? Here's my thing. And maybe I'm just come back on an emotional high. I don't think so, off of a mission trip. But I ask myself, why do so many people blow that off? Why do so many people live indifferent to the gospel of Jesus Christ? When God says there's only one way and there's so many people in our world outside of the southeastern United States who have never even heard that. Unreached people groups all over the world who've never even heard the name of Christ. But if you live in Alabama, you've heard the name of Christ. And we blow it off like it's nothing. It's almost like there's just a lot of people that just don't care and they're going to take their chances. John 10, verse 7, we used this two weeks ago. The scripture was in the sermon. And I was talking about Jesus being the good shepherd and how he's the door, how he lays in the door and protects the sheep. John 10, verse 7 says, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Luke 13, verse 24 says, Strive to enter through the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Acts 4, verse 12, listen to this. It says, And there is salvation and no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. But listen, how we just want to make people be okay with God. How we want to justify sin. 
You've done it and I've done it. Our justifications. We're good people. We're hard workers. But you can be good and you can work hard and not have salvation. Salvation is for an exclusive group of people. No one who is not saved by Christ will go to heaven. You've got to be saved by Christ. Matthew chapter 7. I'm just going to read some scriptures. We've got a couple more minutes here. Matthew chapter 7. You don't even have to turn there. Just listen to this. Matthew chapter 7, 13 through 29, it says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits or grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles. So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. And he goes on and he says this. Listen to this. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I mean, in the scripture, you see two gates, two ways, two destinations, two groups of people, two kinds of trees, two kinds of fruit, two groups at the judgment, two kinds of builders building two kinds of foundations. And with authority, Christ is drawing the line as clearly as as possible between the the way that leads to destruction and the way that leads to life. Salvation is by grace alone through faith, but verse 14 there shows us that it's not easy. Salvation is more than just a prayer. Billy Graham says that there are many people sitting in churches in America today who think they're saved and they're not saved because they understand a false gospel. And here again, I'm not going to bank my life on what Billy Graham says, but Jesus said that. I think Billy Graham probably got that from Jesus. See, salvation is not easy. Salvation calls for knowledge of the truth. Salvation calls for repentance. Salvation calls for submission to Christ Jesus as Lord. And salvation calls for a willingness to obey His will and His word. And verse 16 says that truly saved people will produce works. Verse 21 says that faith that says but does not do is not real faith at all. Jesus wasn't saying that you get saved by works, but Jesus is saying that works result from being saved. Listen to this. James chapter James chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. Aaron quoted it earlier. We didn't even talk about that. That's an awesome thing. Listen to this. It says, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone's a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Doing doesn't get you saved. You can't ever do enough to be saved. All you can do is surrender to Christ. He's the way, he's the truth, he's the life. But one who has surrendered, one who is saved, it will be proven with real works that follow true salvation. See, that's the opposite of the hearer who forgets. It's a doer who acts. Our culture is full of hearers who forget. Listen, I just got back from a place and from a day especially that morning where we went to the pastor's conference where I saw a group of pastors who came because they were desperate to get the word of God to people. Like I said, some of them walked for hours, a few of them for a couple of days, just to come to a conference on hermeneutics that if I'd been going to in seminary, I probably would have tried to find a way to go to the bathroom for a while and miss part of class just so they could preach better. Just so they could help people in their communities understand the word better. They were elated to get one CD with 21 Bible stories on it in their dialect so that people would know the word of God. Listen, our churches, 
our staff, we've got a great staff here, our, pr our programs will never save a soul. We have to be real about the only one who can save souls, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you a mom or a dad and you're not saved? And maybe your child is, but you're too prideful to bow a knee and confess your sin and surrender to Jesus Christ? Or maybe you're a teenager or a college student. And if you were real honest, other things are more important to you than Jesus Christ. Or maybe you're an adult and you're like that. I mean, honestly, is that you? I mean, this is life or death, folks. This is, I'm the way and I'm the truth and I'm the life. And no one comes to the Father unless he comes through me. God, if you want to, if you guys want to come on. In Romans, in Romans, I'm going to turn there to end as these guys are getting ready just to lead us in, in one last song. In Romans chapter 1, just listen to this. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. This is that scripture where I said, Even the creation makes him known. And men, by their unrighteousness, it says, suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, get this, and his divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they, listen, listen to this, so they are without excuse. There's no excuse that will cut it with God. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. In the last two verses, listen to this. Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. And get this, it says, because... They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And isn't that the struggle? Isn't that the struggle this morning if we're, if we're real honest about it? If we're real honest? We, we were coming back um, down the Pan American Highway which was supposed to take us eight hours and took us like 12 and a half. And we nearly missed our plane, but we were, that's a whole different story. But we were coming back and we were, for 45 minutes, we're going into Lima, Peru. And there's, there are, there's shanty house after shanty house. People living in cardboard boxes and those little sheds like we have in our backyards, but not just quite as nice where we park our lawnmowers. Whole families living in those. And as we went through, I thought, man, just vast, vast lostness. I think there's a picture. It's real grainy, but that's what we, you saw it for miles. See those little houses? For miles, you, you, you see that. And I thought, man, vast lostness. And then we kind of got out of that, and I'm looking at the ocean, and I'm just watching. That's kind of left my mind for a second. And then I started thinking about home. I'm ready to get home. I'm ready to see Sharon and Jackson and Emma and Jake and ready to get back to church and get back in the groove of things. And I thought... There's lostness right under our noses here. I think a lot of people hearing and maybe knowing but not doing. You know, and maybe you're here this morning and you've heard, maybe you've been in church and you're in church a lot and you've heard but you just don't know. You just don't know. Scott, you guys, we got Scott and Scott this morning, the two Scotts. They're just going to lead us in worship. And if you don't know Christ this morning, look, we're up here. And um, I'll be glad to talk with you. Josh is here close by. Um, Sharon's here. There's others here. And we will pray with you. We will tell you how to know Christ personally. If you just need to come and pray, maybe you are a believer and you just, you got some stuff going on and, and you just need to come and pray. Come and do that. Let's just sing along with these guys. Let's let God work in our hearts this morning, okay?